is our state bird. Tell me why it shouldn't keep going. Be the golden cheek warbler. Because they migrate. No other bird. Only breeds in Texas. No other bird. How many other states have the northern mockingbird as a state bird? Total of five. We're not unique, or are we unique? Think about it. But that is a picture taken by Joel Sator from National Geographic. He came to Fort Hood for a week to photograph our endangered species. And you know that we're working on because there's the jewelry the male is wearing. So that's one of our nests on the installation. We have a population nowadays approaching 6,000 of them. The black cap vireo, which had been listed as endangered, was delisted a couple of years ago. We started on Fort Hood with 85 known pairs, and they were going down. We now have, ladies and gentlemen, more than 8,500 on the installation. Quite a difference. Quite a difference. We have learned a lot. There's another nest in a juniper, a wren. But the point that I'm making is it's not just that warbler that nests in ash juniper. Many other avian species take advantage of that tree and what it has to offer. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah, but that's a native, that is a native Texas tree. That's the ent tree. And those of you who know what I'm talking about, the ents of a certain series. <laughs> <laughs> so what are these? These are pecans. And yes, many of our bird species love to feast. And I know you've seen them cracking them or where you've got a parking lot underneath the pecan tree, you know that the birds are going, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, crush some pecans. <laughs> because they all love to eat the pecans. Pecan tree is obviously an interesting one, the self-pruning. Those of you that are landowners know that whether you want them or not, you're going to get some branches coming down on their own. But it's a great native tree. And maybe it's best time is coming up within a few weeks. What am I talking about? When they start leafing out, that is the time perfectly synchronized Mother Nature, whatever you wish to call Mother Nature, is perfect because that's when the majority of the migrating birds are coming from way down south. And they'll be hitting here right at about the time that the pecan trees <laughs> are producing the most new vegetation. And there is something on called caterpillars. And that's why the migrating species hit at that very moment. Perfectly synchronized. Perfectly synchronized. Red belly woodpecker. Anybody remember seeing this eagle's nest? That far? You do, very good. Near the city of, we pronounce it Lano, but nobody down in Columbia pronounces it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Yano. <laughs> but this was the nest there. Very visible from the road. Texas Highway Department even made a pullout just so that all of the birds could safely park <laughs> off the road and people could watch the nest. Those are the two adults and they're watching one of the two juniors. They're going, when do you think he's going to leave that nest? <laughs> <laughs> 
What do you think? Or I don't know. The other one left. No problem about this one. I don't know. Which one is the male? Which one is the female? Can you pick them out? Female Very good. Lady well, said the female is the larger one. Absolutely correct. So the female is right there. She is the larger one. If they're not together, they'll look identical. No way can you tell them apart. But when they're together, yeah, easy to do. But that nest was successful. The wind finally got it. They moved to an area where it's no longer visible to the public. I know some of you remember when the sea eagles in Texas, this part of Texas, you had to drive to Lake Buchanan, and I'm watching the heads going north and south to the Canyon of the Eagles. Yeah. And you took a boat to go up the river. Yeah. And you got to see some eagles up there. We now have six eagle nests in Bell County alone. So things have changed. Things have changed and are changing. I'm tracking a new one that might be number seven. I don't know yet. Find out. Let's talk about some other trees. A small tree called the kidney wood. Now, I would say it's a tree with very small wax coated leaves. That tells you you're experts on this, something about this small tree. It is made for dry conditions because the waxy coating on those leaves and the size, the small size of the leaves means they retain moisture. Very important. This is a Texas native. It does come all the way to here, by the way. Now, north of Temple, eh, probably not, <laughs> but let's come here. And you don't see any bugs. Oh, yes. You probably can't, you probably can't see them all, <laughs> but <laughs> there are at least seven insects in that one photo. And that photo was not taken with the purpose of how many insects can you find? I took it for the flower, but there were all these bugs in there. And now comes the reason why this is such an important one of our native trees. Carolina Wren, one of our great songbirds. They'll feed in there. Look at the bill. What's it eat? Bugs. Why is it there? Because of all the bugs. By the way, where do these nest? If you've got a garage that you leave open at times, <laughs> yeah. I think I hit the spot. <laughs> yeah, they'll come and nest in your garage in some corner, or maybe even in the garage will holster up on top in the basket. Coffee can with nails. Yes, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> what more could a wren want? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but it's another example of nature and humans can interact in a very positive manner. Carolina chickadee. They're a fructivore a lot, but at certain times of the year, they have to eat insects. What up? Golden cheek warbler. They're strictly an insectivore. And I've gotten feeding in my kidney wood on a regular basis. It's at my house. Right now, these guys are visiting. Nashville warbler. The passing through right now, one of our earlier migrant warbler species. Again. Bugs. Look at the bill. Long and pointed. Long and pointed bill. True. But when we see a hummingbird at a flower, what 
immediately registers in our minds. What is that hummingbird doing? Getting nectar. I've got a question. How much nectar do you all really think <laughs> the, the, the hummingbirds are getting out of that flower? May I suggest that the tongue that you don't see is in there getting a bug. Another one. Wilson's warbler, they'll be coming through here pretty soon. Better nest here. Strictly migrant. Yellow warbler, strictly a migrant. Notice all of these are in kidney wood. That's what a magnet that tree is. Yellow belly flycatcher. By definition, a bug eater. But now, what happens to those flowers? They turn into seed pods. So, what you a dark eyed jungle, which is here in the wintertime, and join the seeds. That's a very important small tree. Very important. Here's one I know you're familiar with. Now, why is this beautiful white flowering small tree called flame leaf sumac? That's exactly why it's a beautiful tree. It needs to be out in the open, needs full light for it to have that much color. No other option. I consider the flame leaf sumac to be our most valuable winter tree. Bar none. Bar none. Let me try to persuade you. We start with the hermit thrush. The mountain bluebird. Every three or four years, we do get them coming into our part of Texas. Not every year, but every three or four years. Last year, we had them. So that's the fruit of the cement? Or? That's the fruit, yes. Chipping sparrow, we still got them for the season here right now. Not as many as we did during the winter, but there's still some here. He dropped his, you can see. <laughs> <laughs> he caught him just right. And the ladies eat it too. Orange corn warbler. Again, look at that bill we I've talked about it before. That is a bill made for eating bugs. But ladies and gentlemen, especially last year, what he was talking about when it was so blasted cold and frozen. Were there many bugs around? Did anybody get stung by or bit by a bug? Or? No, of course not. So what did the birds do that rely on insects? They have two options. You starve or you find something else to eat. They found something else. Is that the preferred food? No. But will it tie them over? Yes. Very important. Carolina chickadee. Cute little guys. Yeah, them too. But it's another thing, by the way, since some of you have lived here a few years. When you moved here in the 60s, do you see any white wing dove here? Think back. So, no. that's recent. Well, why did we get the white wing dove here? They had a freeze way down in the valley. And the orchards were they perched, roosted, and fed 
had to be cut down because the trees had killed them. So the orchard owners had cut them. What did the birds have to do that relied on those orchards? Find a new place. What did they do? They followed Interstate 35 and a couple of other major roads up north. That's when we got them. What's interesting is they became so used to associating with us that in the middle of Ford Hood, you know how many white wings you can see in the middle of Ford Hood? All right, any. It strictly associated with humans and the trees that we plant and what we provide for. And you know, we feed them well, don't we? Those of you that feed your birds. <laughs> Moving on. Here's the sparrow. That's a beautiful sparrow that we have during the winter. This has a unique categorization in that it's one of the two birds in the whole world species list that only breeds in Canada. There are only two species that only breed in Canada, and that's one of them. But they're here in the winter. Yellow rock warbler. Now, some of us facetiously call them butterbutt. And you can see why. Same thing again, a warbler, insectivore, but in the winter, yes, it will partake of fruit. Another one. There's an obvious one. Woodpecker. Yeah, that bill is made for getting bugs. But it's perfectly good for eating the fruit. That's an unusual one that we get. It's the red shaft that's farther west up here. We get the yellow shaft. But every now and then, we get the red shaft. Red bellied woodpecker. Yep, they love them. That kinglet, that's a tiny little bird. Only about that big. And the bill is long and pointy, and they're bug eaters. But when we've had conditions like we had last February, they will eat whatever tides them over and allows them to survive. There's one of our unusual wintering birds. We have them here, quite a few, including in parks around Georgetown. Beautiful bird pine warbler. Yeah, the Yankee Market bird. Eastern Phoebe. Anytime you see a bird that's called a Phoebe, it means it's a fly catcher. So by definition, it makes a living eating flies. Except when the conditions are cold, wet, miserable. Flame leaf sumac berries. Junko. Blue head vireo. I want you to look at the bill here. You notice that hook at the end? Anytime you see a bird, I want you to think about which birds have got that hook at the end of their bill. Vireos do, loggerhead shrikes do, hawks do, owls do. So what can you ascertain from that? Birds that kill things have got to hook at the end of the bill so they can eat the meat, in essence. Sparrow, no surprise. Unusual bird, and look at the bill. That spells it out about that hook at the end. It's an insectivore. First time that species was seen in winter in our neck of the woods. Why did I have it in my backyard? Because it was cold and miserable, but I had flame leaf sumac berries. That was the first record of that species ever. Goldfinch, no surprise. 
Believe it or not. <laughs> believe it or not, but this is actually a sparrow. The spotted toby is a sparrow, technically. Beautiful bird, obviously. And what they're feeding on, just like the white crown, is plainly sumac. Matter of fact, we're back, I took this photo only a few weeks ago. That's the flame leaf sumac in May. It doesn't get very tall. Not even, yeah, not as tall as this one. Maybe 12 feet. It can get bigger, but most of them don't. But it's got vegetation. Limbs, leaves, from top to bottom and bottom to top. And the bells vary when it, you see feeding its young. That nest is right there. And it provides, that plant provides perfect cover for the nest to be built there. The black cat barrier, which had been one of our endangered species, also nests that high. That's it. Hackberry. <laughs> those of you who have got some fencing along your property, you know that those hackberries keep popping up. That's why. Live oaks. There's a hummingbird, black chin to be exact. Now, why do you suppose it likes these live oak limbs? You notice the beautiful decoration. Lichen, of course. But you also notice the beautiful decoration on the nest. Lichen. How does that little bird do that? I'm gonna put this down because I need to use both hands. <laughs> the nest of the hummingbird is about that big around. And starts with two tiny little eggs. I mean, tiny. No problem. They're much smaller than this. But in the course of maturity, those two little tiny eggs will become tiny, then larger, and then still larger nestlings that are bigger than the circumference of the hummingbird nest. How can that possibly be? What in nature allows for a wall of a tiny nest to adjust to whatever is on the inside of that nest? Spider webs. <laughs> Two answers, both correct. Spider webbing. Because what is it? Flexible. Adjustable. But what's the other characteristic as some bug and some humans find out when we walk through some woods? It's sticky as you know what. That is how they get the lichen to stick to the outside of the nest because of the spider webbing. It's the perfect material to use in nest construction. Nature. Food. That one's obvious. Cosmo holly. White crown sparrow. That's a juvenile, by the way. Field sparrow. Him again. A yellow warbler feeding in a golden ball lead tree. You see the blue, so this is springtime. Why is it in there? Because of the bugs. But here is a titmouse 
in late fall in the same tree feeding on the fruit. It's a legume. Nuts. A topic near and dear my heart. And I know all of you can do what you would like to do, but I wish you could or would do. But if you don't live in an area where you have city ordinances, developers, codes, homeowners associations, yeah, 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 fuck where you guys live. <laughs> if you can leave safely, don't leave a dead tree up next to the house, please. <laughs> but if you've got a dead tree, especially of a soft wood nature, like willow, for example, if you can leave it standing, you will be rewarded. There are so many of our species that are cavity nested that rely on dead trees. And we briefly talked about once I baited him into admitting that was February of last year. I know you read about it that many people had bluebirds dying in bluebird boxes. There's a reason. They're cavity nesters. They start nesting very early every year. But the birdhouses, and I'm talking about quality, well made, well intentioned birdhouses that you can buy and put up for these birds have a problem when we have conditions like last February. They have ventilation spaces on both sides near the roof, and they have drainage holes in the bottom. The cold got in. The birds that were nesting in cavities didn't die. Important lesson. Very important lesson. Oh, I showed this beautiful bird here. Everybody know what this is? Whoa, you are cooking today. <laughs> For monetary warbler, absolutely correct. It's a cavity nester. You find them by our drainages, including in Williamson County. Wherever you have willow trees, because that's a very soft wood, very easy to create cavities in. That's where you find a monetary wall. Beautiful wall. Some people think it's the most beautiful of them all. Smilax, Greenbrier, don't throw me in a briar patch. But think about how important a briar patch is. Think about all the wildlife that maybe you have seen. There's a reason wildlife goes into the briar patch. Because a predator like you ain't going to follow them into that briar patch. And they know it. But there's also berries in there. Edible. That's not one of those sparrows. <laughs> Spotted toby. Sinizo. This is native plants, but let's have an honesty check. This is a Texas native. Is it native here? Does that mean you shouldn't have it? No, don't be so. But when we use the term native, what do we really mean? I want you to think about that. Because there are many plants in East Texas that don't survive here without heroic effort on your part to acidify the soil. There are plants from West Texas, certain yucca, for example, that look good. But you better have some good drainage because if they get wet feet, they're going to croak. I got Texas native. 
I get that it's not mean, it's negative here. So, something to think about. Evergreen sumac. I love that tree. Small tree. And getting close into Christmas time, look at the colors green and red. Those berries are at the fruit level at that time. A lot of birds will feed on them, and quite a few species at this time of year start nesting in them. That's a goldfinch. What's it got there? Pardon? Yeah, it's from the yucca, but what is it from the yucca? Fiber, exactly. Um, and I thought it was is it going to weave it? <laughs> well, it might. There are some birds that will weave it, some birds lay it on, but it is a nesting material and provides insulation. And it's a very good use. Coral honeysuckle, East Texas. Heroic effort to have here. If you want it, sure. Great plant. You better water it. Huh? I brought a piece of the bottle back. I saw it. I saw it. <laughs> yeah. Red yucca. <laughs> now, did I know that little spider was there when I took that picture? No, I didn't. <laughs> But it's a good plant for us to have. Is it native here? No. Where do you have to go? Uh, about 50 miles west of Junction will be the closest you might find it. And the fruit is edible. The titmouse proves it. Chili Pekin. Grows well here. Birds love it, especially when it's really cold. I had two big doves laying in front of one of my windows. And there was some chili bikini right there, and two big dogs lying here, and the sun is shining, and it was cold. The birds flew up, made an assessment. Landed on the dogs <laughs> <laughs> and ate the chili tea. And that is, by the way, edible chili for us, too. Pretty good as a matter of fact. A white honeysuckle, great, one of our native plants. If you have it, it tells me one thing you don't have too many deer. Because if you don't have it, you're living the countryside around here. It means one thing, you've got too many deer, because that's the first thing that they'll wipe out. They love white honey sun. And make no mistake, that has become a problem, and you are the Native Plant Society. You have to think about the impact of our overblown deer population has on native vegetation. You have to consider that. Now, leave it at that. Flowers. Standing cypress, beautiful. Clay manis canthus. When you get a flower, a red flower, funnel shaped of that size, come on! <laughs> Actually, I want you to look at this picture here. Yeah. There it is. It didn't hurt the bird. <laughs> Can spiders catch and eat hummingbirds? Yes. yes. Yellow orb weavers definitely can and will. Make no mistake. <laughs> Says a lot, doesn't it? So important to pollination. <clears throat> B 
People wonder how sometimes hummingbirds get that yellow whatever it is on their bill. Yeah. <laughs> Propagation. Look at that one. Notice how it fit, the bill fits perfectly in between. Nature. Salvia seeds, edible, perfectly good food. <coughs> Carolina snail seed, obvious. Nice vine. Calls indigo down in wet areas along creeks. Why does that cargo? Is that did he get sick because they ate those false indigo? Well, what happened there is it's that time of the year when they molt. And within 10 days, you'll probably be gorgeous again. But that's strictly a matter of molt. Brown thrash on Amphalopsis, another vine down in wet areas. Black chinned hummer, standing cypress. Standing cypress also provides seeds. Cedar sage. Indian paintbrush, obvious. <laughs> Favorite topic, grass and weeds. I start by showing a picture of the ideal lawn. I think that, I think by now, I think you all know what I think it like. Grasses are more in danger of vanishing in this country than trees and forests. We're losing grass, prairie, much faster than any other vegetative habitat. And it is critical because there are so many species that rely almost entirely on grass. Again, a question to some of you more senior citizens. I know you remember when they were about what? All over. Nowadays, we've got a 70%, give or take, reduction in the numbers of Bob White in Texas. Now, everybody knows that it's those important firearms. There's only one problem in Nebraska, where they have zero imported firearms, they also have a 70% reduction. And Bob White's. So could it be that we're overgrazing, overbrowsing, or changing the habitat of native grasses that is affecting the species? I want you to take a look at that photo. How many lawns can you imagine, or even some properties around here that have some cattle on it? Have you ever seen? that diversity of vegetation on those places or seen or seen grass that's all anybody anyone could it be that's why we don't have the bob white anymore I'll go back to speaking in here again. But that's something that's food for thought. That's very important. All right. Gun weed. Yeah, it's a weed. But birds thrive on it. Like the blue grosbeak, beak, goldfinch. Now, this grass here, can I identify this grass? 
I'm being a little bit sneaky here. It's really not a native grass. It looks like Johnson grass. It is Johnson grass. Very good. Which is not a native. Boy, the birds love it. And if I think they're coming in tomorrow. <laughs> Mark your calendar. Tomorrow, the band of bunny will be here. <laughs> the Lincoln sparrows are still here. The wintering bird, they're still here. We'll be for another couple of weeks. John Ragweed, down in the river bottoms. Very important for a lot of avian species. A grass. Very good. Absolutely correct. What's that orchard oriole in there? It's one of our breeding orioles. That's the female. Where does she bring those seeds? Let me show you something. There's a hummer picking seeds. Now, does a hummingbird eat seeds? No. So what? Yes, yes. No, there's no nectar in those seeds. Yes, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, yes. 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 Yes, Notice what she is packing down into her new nest. Seeds. And she packs it down. <laughs> See? But that is why they pick those seeds. They're an insulating material, they're fluffy, they are perfect for hummingbird nests. Chicken sparrow? What kind of seeds were those? Those were from um South Thistle. Exactly. I didn't hear. Them. South Thistle. It's South Thistle. It's, thistle. it's, it's a thistle. Of, it's one of the weediest looking plant pioneer species of bare ground. Yes. And my wife wanted me to remove those, which of course. Yeah. <laughs> Cattails. Yeah. Good nesting material. Red winged blackbird. There's a bird on nest here. You see her? <laughs> More birds nest on the ground than up in trees around here. And to do that, they must have cover and concealment, not the perfect lawn. There she is. See her eye? That's a plantain. Yeah, now watch. Look up in the corner. Oh, yeah. You can see the mouths of the babes. <laughs> That's a Rufus crowned sparrow. Can that nest be built in the average backyard? <laughs> they have to have tall vegetation. 
Look at her looking around. She has no idea she's being videoed. <laughs> what kind of predators are then or she? I'm sorry? She's opening herself up to other predators, snakes or rabbits. I'll show you how come she survives. Now she's getting ready to leave. We'll talk about it. Come on, baby. Hello. You can hear the young, I don't know if you can hear the young squeaking. It's a more chow. You can see the little mouse. Ah! Looks around. Now watch. I think it stopped because she comes in again from here. And what I'm getting at is the only time you hear noise out of that nest is when the adult is bringing food. Any other time, the kids are told, keep your. <laughs> and they abide by it because of the possibility of predation. Because by being a ground nester, but when are you more vulnerable? If you're in that concealed vegetation, in that location, or up on a limb of a tree? I had a bluebird and a fox and a snake. I, I hadn't seen mom and dad going in and out. And I pulled it down and there was a snake crawling yeah. inside. Nature. <laughs> I know you may not like it, but snakes can eat too. And there's some birds that really like snakes. <laughs> In conclusion. <laughs> <laughs>